Well, uh, we now come to the concluding session, and uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, they say, perhaps this could just be the icing on the cake. So those who uh, uh, might not know Mr. Kishan Verma well, uh, Mr. Kishan Verma is a former director of the Aviation Research Center and special secretary to the government of India in the cabinet secretariat. During an illustrious career spanning 35 years, he has held several key appointments within India and abroad. He has held sensitive assignments in politically and socially fragile militancy affected border regions of JNK and India's northeast. Mr. Verma's diplomatic assignments include postings to countries in South Africa and the United States. His areas of specialization are China, the Far East, the Koreas, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific and the Indian Ocean region. Mr. Verma closely follows developments in South Asia and Africa from an economics and security perspective. He has practical experience in dealing with multifaceted security challenges international terrorism and global issues pertaining to energy security, trade and commerce, science and technology. He is the recipient of awards for distinguished and meritorious service from the Prime Minister of India. And currently, Mr. Verma serves on the board and in an advisory capacity to several corporate entities in the field of defense, cyber security, nuclear energy and finance. It's a pleasure having you here, and it's a pleasure handing it over to you to chair. We look forward to a stimulating discussion, Mr. Verma. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nair, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, all uh, on the panel and my distinguished uh, co-panelists. It's, um, it's a matter of uh, honor, in fact, and a privilege to be uh, chairing as well as moderating this very useful uh, discussion as it will unfold, I'm sure. Uh, you know, when I first saw the name on the panel and I said, well, you have saved uh, the best for the last. And I think uh, Mr. Nair did mention that. Uh, but having seen the scholarship that has preceded us, I shouldn't make a slight at, at all those presenters. I think there will be some superb, excellent uh, and excellent, insightful presentations uh, through the yesterday and most of today. Therefore, I think I would just say that uh, last but not least, I think this panel discussion will provide an insight into why we think uh, the Chinese are where they are, uh, what actually brings them there. I'll try to give a contextual framework uh, to their um, uh, doctrine about uh, the Indian Ocean region as to how they are there, as well as try and, and uh, enumerate and encapsulate the kind of uh, concerns that they have, uh, why are they, and, and how they're trying to meet these. And then lastly, uh, talk about India's concerns and then India's options in this regard. Uh, before I launch into my uh, presentation, let me also thank the Institute of Compre Contemporary Studies Bangalore, Chennai Center for China Studies and the Press Institute of India for uh, inviting me to speak on this uh, very, very important and very timely forum. So without further ado, let me uh, get into this. I, I presume, uh, Mr. Nair, that we have about 15 minutes each, uh, uh, and then we go in for question and answer. So I'm just going by that format. If you want me to sort of curtail at any given time, just somebody just has to intervene and let me know. Uh, but okay, I will feel free, uh, Mr. Verma. There's no problem. 15 minutes oh, is fine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for indulgence. Uh, let me start by uh, a little bit of a historical perspective on China. You know, we saw the first ambition, the aspirations of being a maritime power way back in the 15th century when Admiral Chang He uh, launched on his voyages across the Indian Ocean and in fact went into, uh, went to visit uh, Andaman and Nicobar and then came away to many, many countries in the Indian Ocean region. It had global ambitions of a maritime power. But for the next 200 years odd, uh, they became closeted. They started looking inwards. They were uh, riddled with internecine warfare. There were uh, countries which actually came in and invaded China, and they went through a lot of turmoil and they became inward looking. We see them coming back into this after about uh, for the last three decades when they've made a very clear indication about their deep and expanded interest in the Indian Ocean. And this is not only as far as uh, commercial interests are concerned because about 90% of the energies flow through the Indian Ocean. But uh, it's also 
uh, enhancing a, a PLA, a, a, a military presence in the Indian Ocean region. Now, uh, this has not happened just out of the blue in the last three decades. There has been a, a contextual framework which has come about. They have actually, as I mentioned earlier, a doctrine which uh, has uh, slowly unraveled. And I'm going to come out with a couple of uh, uh, excerpts of the defense white papers that they had come out, uh, that they had actually made public uh, during this period. The first one that we saw, uh, the China's first defense white paper, which was released in 1998, reflected limited naval ambitions and took pains to note that China uh, does not station any troops or set up any military bases in any foreign country. In fact, President Hu Jintao appended and enlarged the scope of the Navy's ambitions in a speech to the Central Military Commission in 2004, in which he charged the PLA with defending China's expanding national interests and safeguarding world peace. These new, newly public and publicly articulated missions foreshadowed a more ambitious and active expeditionary role for the Navy. The 2006 Defense White Paper noted the rise of security related issues pertaining to energy and international shipping groups and the 2008 paper sharpened china's public focus on a rising global competition for resources and expressed the need for the plan to have the capability to conduct cooperation in distant waters uh, following this in 2008 the plan began a series of con con uh, counter piracy deployments in the gulf of eden which it has continued almost without interruption to the present day these deployments have involved a regular rotation of service vessels and occasionally conventional and nuclear attack submarines as well. The PLN has used more than a decade of such deployments to develop its blue water logistics capabilities and justify its military presence far from Chinese shores. Subsequent Chinese defense white papers continue to gradually expand the public ambit and specificity of the PLAN's ambitions. The 2010 paper highlighted the importance of logistic support for out-of-area activities. The 2013 paper noted explicitly the development of blue water capabilities and listed specific missions, such as protecting merchant vessels, evacuating Chinese citizens abroad, and providing reliable security support for Chinese interests overseas. I think the most important one was in 2015, the white paper, when it actually delineated eight strategic tasks, strategic tasks for the PLA. I'm going to read them out. I'm quoting, effectively safeguard the sovereignty and security in China's territorial land, air, and sea. Resolutely defend the unification of the motherland. Safeguard China's security and interests in new domains. Safeguard the security of China's overseas interests. Maintain strategic deterrence and carry out nuclear counterattack. Participate in regional and international security cooperation and maintain regional and world peace. Strengthen efforts in operational against infiltration, separatism and terrorism. And perform such tasks as emergency rescue and disaster relief, rights and interests protection, guard duties and support for national economic and social development. Subsequent defense documents released in 2017 and 2019 expounded on these themes and did so. Uh, they seem designed to support the narrative vision of the Belt and Road Initiative, giving particular emphasis to the PLA's role in protecting Chinese interests and citizens overseas. It is possible to discern several broad objectives that drive Chinese military presence in the regions, securing key sources of energy, protecting overseas investments, and, and citizens, bolstering China's reputation and political influence, and maintaining strategic deterrence. I am now going to go into um, uh, quoting a, a paper which I saw, which was, I thought, a very, very insightful paper by Joshua White, recently released. He actually uh, talks about uh, and elaborates on most of these themes. Uh, he says, the PLA, in developing an array of military platforms, that due to the endurance and defensive capabilities are likely to be utilized in the Indian Ocean region. The first aircraft carrier, the Liaoning in 2012, and its ongoing indigenous carrier program, perhaps the most significant contribution to the PLAN, out of area capabilities, has come from the rapid development of other major surface combatants, many of which have already been deployed in the Indian Ocean region. 
These include guided missile cruisers, destroyers, frigates. The PLAN has also brought six large amphibious transport docks that can house four air cushioned landing craft and four helicopters and is building a fleet of even larger amphibious assault ships that can carry over two dozen helicopters to undertake sustained missions in the IOR. For replenishment and auxiliary vessels, including oilers, salvage and rescue ships, hospital ships and transport vessels are also have been uh, brought in. The alien submarine fleet, which is heavily geared towards anti uh, surface and land attack missiles, uh, has also slated to grow. Both conventional and nuclear powered submarines have undertaken con control uh, patrols in the Indian Ocean and made port calls at friendly countries. The PLA is investing in enablers to support specific overseas missions in the Indian Ocean region. The PLF presently has limited expeditionary capabilities, but is expanding its long range air fleet, airlift fleet that has episodically for humanitarian assistance been used and for disaster relief operations, just as we saw in Libya in 2011, and exercise engagements with foreign militaries. <clears throat> there are security cooperation and strategic investments which the Chinese have also made. It has increased its military related engagements with countries in the IOR. Data show that the PLA's engagements in Asia began a steep annual rise in 2012. Its aggregate number of outbound rival port calls, apart from uh, naval port calls, apart from uh, uh, those related to counter piracy task force, began rising dramatically in 2013. And international military exercises began a similar trend in 2014. These trend lines similarly apply for the PLA's engagements specifically in the Indian Ocean region. Noted, uh, the, one of the more notable uh, movements in this sphere was the pair of submarine visits to Colombo in 2014, the first visit to the region by a Chinese nuclear powered submarine, which made a port call to Karachi in 2016. And the presence of a sizable PLAN surface and submarine presence operating in the Indian Ocean at the Sino Indian Doklam crisis unfolded in the summer of 2017. China's most robust military relations, as we all know, in the IOR is with Pakistan. I'm not going to delve very much into the details of this. I think all of us here are uh, well aware of all the uh, inroads that they've made into, into that sphere. But uh, suffice it to say that as part of the multi-billion dollar China-Pakistan economic corridor, Beijing has, has helped to build our, uh, the Pakistan's fiber optic infrastructure. And this has provided grants and loans to develop the remote deep water port at Gwadar. It can also use Karachi for uh, as name. Bangladesh is the other uh, literal country which it has focused interest on. It is, uh, we all know what it has done. It is already building some naval port facilities in that area. It has been supplying military equipment and engagement, engaging the countries uh, in, in a formal defense uh, a cooperation uh, partner. And, and, and become a leading defense supplier. It has purchased submarine jet trainers and other major equipment as well as small arms from China. Their military personnel train and exercise together and the Bangladesh military has deepened uh, ties with the PLA even as it has sought to assuage its neighbor India that China will not be given a strategic foothold in the Bay of Bengal. It has reportedly declined several Chinese offers to develop ports with more strategic potential. Uh, other than um, uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, we know that uh, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, the Chinese are investing a lot of money in trying to build up a more robust relationship. It has used Colombo as an occasional port of call. The two militaries are engaged in joint exercises and the PLA has donated a frigate to the Sri Lankan Navy and is constructing facilities at the Sri Lankan Military Academy. Uh, there is significant Chinese investment, including commercial development of the Colombo port and the controversial 99 year lease of Ambantota port to a Chinese state owned enterprise. With the uh, Maldives, uh, it has also been uh, um, an area of interest for the uh, Chinese. They have uh, been there uh, and, and established some listening station as we hear. They've also gone to Seychelles. Uh, they are also in Mauritius and they've also built some facilities in Djibouti. Uh, Myanmar is also an important part of the literal uh, 
uh, reach outreach for the Chinese. Uh, it has seen a major focus of China's BRI efforts as part of the so-called China Myanmar Economic Corridor. China has proposed significant investments in oil and, and gas pipelines that would link its Yunnan province and with the Bay of Bengal, terminating at a deep water port at Chongqing. Pele's mission in the uh, uh, the kind of uh, activity that is taking in that region, in the, in the Indian Ocean region, if I could sort of uh, bring it into some just some points, I'm not going to go into detail of each of these points. We could save it for the Q and A, and perhaps the audience is well aware of these. But I'll just put them together just to uh, give a little focus. The objectives uh, of the pre presence of, uh, of the Chinese in the Indian Ocean region is to conduct non-combatant activities focused on protecting Chinese citizens and investments, as for bolstering China's soft power influence, undertake counter-terrorism activities unilaterally with partners against organizations that threaten China, collect intelligence in support of operational requirements and against key adversaries, support efforts aimed at coercive diplomacy towards small countries in the region and lastly enable effective operations in a conflict environment namely the ability to deter mitigate or terminate a state-sponsored interdiction of trade bound for china and to meaningfully hold at risk us or indian assets in the event of a wider conflict uh, let me uh, now move on to some of uh, the concerns the Chinese have, I think uh, we can only get a holistic picture of what uh, their, uh, the reasons for their presence in the Indian Ocean. Uh, I'm going to put them in, in, in sort of bullet points. So it becomes a little easier for us to, uh, to assimilate. Uh, it's, I think it's very concerned, of, first of all, of India's geographic location, the peninsular nature of our geography. Uh, the locational threat that India poses in terms of uh, being able to interdict uh, Chinese trade and energy routes. Indian naval activity beyond the Malacca states into the uh, South China Seas and the Western Pacific region has also been a cause of concern for the Chinese. As one PLA general said, and I quote, India is trying to jump out of the South Asian path into the Indian Ocean region. A concern over the Andaman and Nicobar Islands located at the mouth of the Malacca Strait which sees 50% of global trade and 90% of Chinese energy imports come through and can be interdicted by Indian naval presence in the Andaman and Nicobar island chain. They believe that India will strategically block and contain China east of the Malacca Strait. And this was described by President Hu Jintao in 2003 as China's Malacca dilemma. India, it also believes that India will take advantage of the US-China rivalry to develop a new sort of relationship with the US and in partnership thwart in China's ambition to become a global power. India's proximity to the US therefore becomes a threat multiplier for China. India also believes, uh, sorry, China also believes that the next 10 years, it has a strategic window of opportunity to push into the IOR as US is distracted with rebuilding their diminished power and influence over the period, over the past four or five years, and this will continue to diminish relatively over the next five years or so. India, it considers a relatively weaker, its economy one-fifth the size of the Chinese and the army one-fourth its size. Rather than wait till 2030 when India becomes stronger, the right time to strengthen their presence and all their activities in the IOR is right now. Uh, but there are key hurdles for China and they realize this. The first one is that China is not an Indian Ocean country. It does not have territory in the Indian Ocean region. Its passage into the Indian Ocean region can be blocked. The Malacca Straits as well as the Lombok and Sunda Straits are straits which can be blocked. So therefore, it is doing some exercises as to how to fight blockades, etc. Thirdly, US-India partnership to contain China, which China views as Indo-US Condominium. I'm using this phrase, which has been borrowed from uh, our just uh, Gokhale, who spoke the other day in another uh, forum. Uh, now, how does it uh, begin to handle and overcome these hurdles? I've jotted down a few points. First of all, it must distract India's attention from the maritime to the land border. It build a pressure on the land border. 
There are finite resources that are going into defense. They hope that most of it will go to the army and less will go to the arm and, and the Air Force for the land border defense and less to the Navy. Using economic assistance, political patronage, military assistance to induce smaller countries in India's neighborhood to become a virtual Indian Ocean country and induce these countries to optimize its bilateral relations with some of the literal countries and thus be accepted by them as a resident power, just like the US has a virtual presence there through alliances and presence of vessels, etc. It also is fears, passages being blocked, and to overcome this, it's using dual use infrastructure carefully selected in Chokfu, Amantota, Kwada, Seychelles, Djibouti. Chinese believe that they're building close relations with these countries, they can be developed into supply bases for the PLAN overseas operations, and if it comes to a wider uh, conflict. Uh, the next point uh, that they're trying to do is to create dissonance and differences in domestic public opinion about what actually the situation of the US vis-a-vis -vis India is. Uh, they are actually harping on uh, through their media that India is going to be colonized by the US. It is going to become subservient to the US. It will lose its strategic autonomy if it continues the way it is. It is also getting more proficient in using democracy, democracy and tools like free media to manipulate India's public opinion. It also is trying to get India's neighbors concerned about the US-India condominium, which will allow India to become a sub-hegemon, as it puts it. You could, we would recall since 1949, whenever there has been any difference uh, between India and China, they've always uh, looked at, the, at the India's periphery and its neighbors and blamed India as a hegemonic power in South Asia. Now, it's believed that in concert with the US, India will act even more hegemonic. And therefore, it is actually pandering to some of the fear of the neighboring countries, uh, which vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis India. Now, while Bangladesh, Singapore, and Malaysia, and the UAE will not buy into this concern, but countries like Myanmar, Iran, Pakistan, which already have a suspicion of the US are likely to buy into this. This is something that we really need to work on. And therefore, for India, both Myanmar and Iran are critical in the neighborhood, and we need to be alert about this. China is likely to increase their hydrographic survey and continue to create infrastructure in the region, offer to build military to military relationship with these countries in the region, sell arms cheap at friendship prices routinize their presence of PLAN by frequent visits to ports, conduct joint exercise and patrols in the northern Indian Ocean and places like Iran, Pakistan, etc. So that at a, in a matter of time, they can uh, call their increased presence in the region as routine. Now, what is of concern for India as I go into the next phase of my, uh, of my talk about uh, India's options? Concerns with India is really that uh, the Chinese are trying to begin to, in fact, uh, securitize their trade routes and the sea lanes of communications for it. So, Mr. Krishan Verma, sir, sorry to interrupt, but some yes. of the panelists need to go back. So, okay. I would kindly request you to allow them to speak and then share their discussion. Sorry for the intervention. Can I can I just take two minutes on this? Sure, sir. All right, I'll, I'll close. So, deploy assets to protect their trade, therefore, to augment it in the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea not just the Indian Ocean. China is in, engaged in hydrographic surveys. We talked about it. And for India, the concern is to try and get China to follow the international rule-based order, which is most unwilling to do. So India's options, I'm just going to put them in four bullet points. Press ahead with the Indo-Pacific vision as enunciated by PM Modi. Not get distracted by Chinese moves on the land frontier, not by way of any diminishing importance of land borders, but keep an eye on the maritime domain. Therefore, focus attention on strengthening relations with IORA, the ASEAN, the GCC, Africa, where the Chinese are vulnerable, so as to minimize or reduce the space for China to insert itself into this region. Enhance interconnectivity in our region, invest in infrastructure development, including islands, and offer, if the, if the literal countries wish to do so, security for their projects, which can be negotiated bilaterally. Internally, we should strengthen the Navy. We should uh, focus on capital acquisition, ships, underwater vessels, indigenous developments, and marine domain 
awareness. We should leverage the large number of islands we have and develop jointness and operations, challenge Chinese in the exclusive economic zone, continental shelf, and become net security provider for the region. Let me stop here uh, uh, because of, for the interest of time. And uh, if I could uh, immediately move on to my distinguished panelists, uh, may I invite uh, the first uh, uh, speaker in, in uh, Admiral Chatterjee? Uh, he has been on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and uh, he has commanded that. Let me just read out his uh, bio very briefly. Uh, Vice Admiral Chatterjee is a submariner. He has commanded two submarines, a frigate and a guided missile destroyer, and has held many important staff billets over his checkered service of 40 years. National Defense Academy, Khadakwasla Defense Services Staff College, Wellington and National Defense College, New Delhi. At mid-career level, he headed the Director of Submarine Operations as well as Submarine Acquisitions with the Indian Naval Headquarters. He has served as Flag Officer Submarine as well as Flag Officer Commanding Maharashtra and Gujarat area in the aftermath of the 26-11 attack in Mumbai. On being promoted in the rank of Vice Admiral in 2009, he served as Inspector General of Nuclear Safety, where he steered the Navy's nuclear submarine program. The Admiral also served as Deputy Chief of the Navy for, the, for two years. He was thereafter elevated as Commander-in-Chief in June 2014 and commanded the Andaman Nic uh, Nicobar Command, India's only tri-service command, and appointed as an honorary ADC to the President of India. He is a recipient of the now Seda Medal, the Ati Vishesh Seva Medal, and Param Vishesh Seva Medal. Over to you, Admiral Chatterjee. Sorry. Well, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen, and thank you, Chair, for uh, that generous introduction and the the your uh, your uh, painting of the entire canvas of the Chinese Navy and the geopolitical and geostrategic aspects of the Indian Ocean and. This panel discussion is uh, on uh, the Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean. Well, I think you have broadly covered most of it. And if there is anything specific I would, you would like to know, uh, I would request you to ask me those questions. But I just want to touch on two, two issues. Uh, number one is that uh, the enormous speed at which the Chinese Navy is is uh, increasing its strength. It's uh, practically almost three times the speed as the Indian Navy. And this is something which we have to bridge if we want to, uh, you know, have adequate uh, forces uh, present to thwart the Chinese in the next decade. The issue is that uh, today, even if, as China has, say, roughly about uh, 90 major vessels and 10 nuclear submarines, uh, it would only be, uh, it is the, the Straits, the, the Malacca Straits, the Sunda Straits, the Lombok, and the Umbai Water Straits, which is actually constricting the Chinese Navy to come whole hog into the Indian Ocean. And the most important part is undetected. And that is not possible simply because of the type of satellite surveillance, etc., that we have today, and these, you know, ground-based listening systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, as I would see that, where we would need to concentrate our efforts, it would be to detect and track the nuclear submarines of the PLA Navy, and that is going to be. Uh, tall order, unless we are really focused on that. And it would need a three-dimensional approach, if I would say, from ground-based systems, then uh, to, to surface surveillance, and then air surveillance, and the fourth dimension of satellite surveillance. So that is going to be a very important aspect. So as I have said, uh, we are uh, lacking because of our rate of uh, speed of uh, kind of building our warships. Uh, we've got to catch up. The other thing I would like to tell you is that uh, over the years, the quality of Chinese uh, built uh, warships have also improved. And uh, this I can say uh, with my 
personal experience of visiting some Chinese ships in the countries that, uh, of course, uh, they were uh, given to. Uh, of course, they were the export versions, and uh, I don't think there could be much difference uh, between the export versions and in the, the ones that they had themselves. So uh, I think I'll uh, restrict myself to this. You have already spoken about the road states, et cetera, which they have where, from where they could launch uh, their uh, ships and turn them around and should there be a defect rectification, et cetera, required. Uh, Hamban Tota, uh, as I've, uh, you know, I've heard from some of the eminent uh, Sri Lankan uh, panelists and speakers, and they have categorically said that there is no way whatsoever, you know, we are going to allow any Chinese warships to come and uh, use Haman Tota, uh, irrespective of how, you know, whatever debt uh, we, we may have with China. So anyway, these are just statements, but uh, when time comes, we'll see. So I think I'll end with that. And if there are some other questions, uh, please uh, let me know, because I think you have generally covered all aspects that need to be known. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Admiral Chatterjee. I think we'll uh, save the questions and answers towards the end of it, because I think we are running a bit against time. And uh, therefore, uh, and I think you've also comprehensively brought out the issues that uh, actually pertain uh, to our concerns and perhaps India's options also has been covered by you. So may I just uh, reach out uh, to uh, the next uh, distinguished panelist, uh, which is Air Marshal Vartaman. Um, if I may just give you a, a, a brief introduction about his background uh, before I request him to take the floor. Uh, he's a postgraduate from the Defense Services Staff College, Wellington. His Chennai-based Air Marshal Vatman family has been has had unbroken service in the IAF since 1943. Uh, he has joined Sainik School uh, in 62 and the India in 69, commissioned as a fighter pilot in 73. And Air Marshal went on to serve nearly 40 years, flying 4,000 hours in over 40 different types of aircraft. A chief test pilot at ASTE Bangalore, uh, Air Marshal Vatraman has, has flown most of the fighter, transport, and helicopters in service. He commanded a MiG-21 squadron in the Northeast. During the Kargil conflict in 1999, he coordinated aircraft upgradation that proved instrumental in the success of the air campaign. In 2001, he was in command of an operational air base on the western border when the country was close to war with Pakistan after the terrorist attack on the Indian parliament. Designated as the air attaché in Paris, Air Marshal Vartaman has had the opportunity to fly the Rafale in 2006. On return to India as Air Vice Marshal, he continued to strengthen ties with Air Force of the world as head of the Air Force Intelligence. Soon after, he, assigned, he was assigned to take over the Air Force Modernization Program and long-term plans at Air Headquarters, New Delhi. On promotion to Air Marshal, he was appointed as the Senior Air Staff Officer responsible for Air Operations with Strategic Central Air Command. Later, he was promoted and appointed Air Force Commanding Chief for Eastern Air Command during a crucial period of the nation's Look East policy. The President of India awarded him the highest military peacetime award of the Param Vishish Seva Medal for distinguished service of an exceptional order. In addition, he has also been awarded the Ati Vishish Seva Medal, Vayu Sena Medal, and Vishish Seva Medal for distinguished service. He retired uh, from the IF in, in 2012, but I know he's very current and up to date with the, all the activities that happen in the strategic domain. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Air Marshal Vatman for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Varma. I'll just uh, get on uh, the presentation. <clears throat> okay, am I audible? Uh, Mr. Varma, you, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Clear. Oh. Not and the screen is visible? Yes, it is. It is. It is very clear. Right. Um, thank you, Mr. Varma, for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, it's my honor to be part of this uh, uh, fantastic uh, seminar. Uh, I got a very short notice, and Commodore uh, Vasan uh, called me over to talk uh, as a stopgap. And uh, he put me on to work for the la next 15-16 uh, hours where I put this presentation together and uh, listened to 
most of the presentation in the last two days. A superb canvas, a very wide canvas that was covered. And I don't think uh, they have missed out anything else. So when I was hearing it, I, I, was, uh, I, I said, let me talk about the teeth part of it because we have seen the security threat that is and how it is developing and what, or what we think, what we decipher that uh, China is going to do. So I will restrict myself to the teeth part of it. And uh, that is the Air Force element. Uh, my good friend uh, uh, Shankar is, will come after me and speak about the army element. Um, the concept note uh, brings out very well. Uh, however, due to the political leadership's continental outlook and extended bouts of sea blindness, invaders who came across the sea subjugated us for several centuries. The continental outlook is, is what uh, I have been through, at least for the uh, 40 years I've been in the Air Force. It has been only Pakistan and China. We never looked down the peninsula. And we came down to the peninsula only when we had to uh, train, when we became instructors. And we trained ab initio uh, 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 boys to learn flying. Otherwise, everything was uh, operations was only in the north. And all we knew was uh, a majority part of our career was uh, how we liaise with the army uh, to win the wars in the north. Um, fortunately for us, the things have changed. And uh, we have started looking south. And uh, looking south, I thought I will just uh, put in the kind of weapon systems that we have generated, what we have, uh, uh, which can uh, threaten the Chinese uh, Navy when it enters our Indian Ocean region. So I thought I'll just cover initially a little bit of the continental threat that was mentioned, then come down to the Chinese uh, maritime threat, only restricting to the weapon systems that can uh, 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 restrict our uh, Air Force operations. Then I'll talk about the Air Force uh, force levels that we have and how much uh, can be committed. And uh, of course, uh, there is one limitation, uh, which is part of this talk. I'll cover that as well. All the information that I'm going to give now is open source information, which is uh, available at uh, most sources. My experience with the Navy has been only in uh, two aspects. And one was uh, uh, when um, uh, my uh, squadron that I commanded, the 30 squadron, we affiliated with INS Brahmaputra. That was my first association with uh, uh, in the Indian Navy. This was in uh, 2008. And thereafter, I was very fortunate to spend a day and a half on the USS Nimitz. And I was uh, completely bowled over by the entire city that was uh, sailing uh, on the uh, in the Indian Ocean. OK, let's come to the Chinese threat as such. Um, uh, as an Air Force guy, 1962, uh, I always get this question, why you guys were sleeping? Why didn't you all do something? Yes, we did have the capacity to do it. We had the potential to do it. Perhaps we could have changed the, uh, the, the result of the 1962 war. Um, that is not, I don't want to exaggerate, exaggerate anything more from it. But uh, all the same, it created a huge stigma in our uh, Indian psyche. And uh, we kept watching the China, uh, China grow up thereafter. And every time the infrastructure was being built up in, at a phenomenal speed, uh, every strategist went around uh, talking about uh, the super speed at which uh, China is uh, building. And uh, they, uh, they covered uh, the technological boom. And every time they kept expanding more and more and more, it only sort of uh, gave us a complex, how are we going to handle China as a warrior? So when, um, when I was in the Central Air Command, thereafter when I went to command the East, uh, well, I started looking. I said, come on, now we got to look at the, there must be chinks in the armor uh, of the Chinese. And how do we go about handling it? So one guy gets up and says, sir, they built up a beautiful uh, uh, train system from Kinchai to uh, Lhasa, uh, which is at uh, four, uh, which uh, uh, the train um, uh, travels at 4.5, 4.8 kilometers. You need oxygen to be in the, uh, if you've got to be passengers, and uh, these kind of infrastructures and the uh, kind of road systems. So I said, come on, let's pick up the weak, weak links in the communication systems. And very soon we realized that it's no big deal. 
we can um, um, uh, checkmate the Chinese. And thereafter, we have to checkmate as well as their uh, 1,200 surface surface missiles, which he, perhaps if I was a uh, Chinese general, I would only launch the surface to surface uh, missiles instead of sending my aircraft. So how do we handle that? So this was the continental threat that we all got used to. And we found that air power can beautifully support uh, uh, the, the ground forces in, uh, in uh, checkmating the Chinese. And uh, the air power being in a very offensive arm, we can really play up, uh, quite, uh, you know, play up a, a lot of uh, damage deep inside uh, the Chinese territory. Now, that was the continental threat. So let's come down to the, to the maritime threat. Many, as, uh, many aspects of this maritime threat have been touched upon in the various uh, talks that we had. And uh, once they come into the Indian Ocean region, what kind of a threat could uh, uh, affect us? For me, as an Air Force fighter pilot, I look at, firstly, any threat from the air. Secondly, I look at uh, threats which can be, you know, the surface-to-air missiles on board, uh, on, um, on board ships that can threaten my, uh, uh, can threaten me. So when we look at the uh, ships that are available, um, we find that there were two carriers, the Leoning, which was covered, and the second uh, uh, carrier, which is the Shandong. Now on board the Leoning carrier and the Shandong is the J-15 um, uh, uh, carrier-borne aircraft. That aircraft is from the Su-27 family, a very heavy platform, extremely heavy platform. Uh, because of its weight and the ski jump which it uh, uses, it really cannot uh, get airborne with its full warload as well as uh, the full uh, uh, fuel. So therefore, the uh, armament that which is weapons which is going to come up in the air and counter us is going to be limited. One. Secondly, he is going to have very limited endurance, uh, basically because he is not carrying enough fuel. So recently, they have gone into something called the buddy refueling. So you have uh, another uh, J-15 airborne from the carrier, which is uh, hovering in the air, which is uh, orbiting in the air. So this uh, attack aircraft uh, J-15 gets airborne, tanks up with the, uh, the aircraft in orbit, takes the fuel from that, uh, uh, from that as a buddy, and thereafter extends its range. That is one aspect. And uh, the other thing is, they just got about 15 to 20 of them, there are no further orders for the J-15. And um, there is a, a talk that there is going to be a J-15 upgrade, which they call the J-15B, which is uh, likely to come up. And uh, that's in a distant future. So as far as an air a airborne threat is concerned, when the Chinese Navy comes into the Indian Ocean region, is going to be nothing very um, um, uh, credible at all to threaten the Indian Air Force. And there is another carrier under construction, which they call today as the 003, which uh, perhaps will be a much bigger carrier and, and have uh, different launch systems uh, other than the ski jump, which you see here. The two carriers uh, are here, the Leoning and the Shandong. I don't expect, in my assessment, I don't expect that to enter the Indian Ocean region for a long time to uh, come. Uh, as you all know, the Leoning is a very old carrier, which was built by the by Soviet Russia. It used to be called the, uh, I think it was called the Riga, and thereafter uh, the Ukrainians, uh, after the Soviet Union split, uh, called it the Varyag, and the Chinese uh, bought this as almost like scrap, built on it, and that's the Leoning. The Shandong is a brand new uh, carrier. The talks uh, from the Chinese are there are uh, the Chinese are planning to make 10, maybe even uh, 15 carriers, but the, that's very, very, very in the distant future. Uh, they are also planning to have uh, stealth aircraft airborne from the carrier because if they want to think that uh, they can counter the, the US Navy carriers, which operates the F 35 uh, stealth, um, they thought, um, I mean, they believe that they also need the stealth. But once again, that's at least another 15 years away before uh, weaponized stealth aircraft gets airborne from a Chinese carrier. So against these kind of assets, what do we have? What, what does the Indian Air Force uh, come up with? Uh, basically, we have a few uh, dedicated uh, maritime strike squadrons. 
the sixth quadrant, which is ba- used to be based in Pune, now it's in Jamnagar. It's a Jaguar Maritime Strike Squadron, which has flown with the Navy for uh, perhaps the last 30, 40 years. Um, uh, in the last uh, 30, 40 years, the Jaguar has been upgraded in the recent past. It's, uh, it, it's uh, in a very well upgraded form with a brand new uh, 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 Israeli radar and a, a new uh, anti-ship missile, which I will talk about. The Su-30 MKI, they have one dedicated squadron, 30 squadron in uh, Pune, my old squadron, which is based in Pune. And there's a lot of uh, flying with the Western Naval Fleet. Um, it, it, is, uh, it has anti-ship weapons. Um, recently, considering the threat which is developing in the, in the peninsula, the Air Force Station Tanjavur was created and we raised the very first uh, Su-30 MKI squadron, uh, triple two squadron in Tanjavur. This was just uh, not even six months ago. It is now operational in the peninsula and it gives a wide area of the both sides of the uh, coastline where it can operate. The Rafale, which has been recently inducted and it's in Ambala, has its own anti-ship missile, which I will talk about is one of the deadliest missiles. Um, what are the bases, the operational air bases that we have, uh, uh, are one in the Kar Nicobar, which uh, uh, in the Nicobar Islands, which we call the Kar Nicobar. And you can see that it is uh, it straddles very close to the Straits of Malacca. Here is uh, Kar Nicobar. And uh, any of our fighter, including the Jaguar, which operates from it, uh, can uh, threaten any egg, any of the ships that uh, are exiting out of the Straits of Malacca. The other, uh, um, this is the aerial view of uh, the beautiful looking uh, Kar Nicobar Air Base. Uh, the other air base, which I mentioned just now, was the, is the Tanjavur Air Base. Uh, the first one in uh, Tamil Nadu with a fighter, I mean, actually it's the second. The first one is uh, Sulur, which has uh, two Tejas squadrons. Uh, the maritime squadron is in Tanjavu, and you can see what a beautiful location it is. It can uh, actually monitor the entire uh, the IOR, and considering the range of the Su-30, it has got a phenomenal uh, reach. Notwithstanding the two dedicated uh, uh, air bases, which uh, I mentioned about, there are so many other bases uh, close uh, in the peninsula area and a little upper peninsula. That is, of course, the, the naval base at Arakonam, uh, Chennai, Trivandrum, Cochin, Goa, Vizag, Kalaikunda, which is uh, uh, near Calcutta, uh, Pune, Jamnagar, Bhuj, and Nalia. All these uh, bases are capable of handling the fighters, which, which I've just uh, mentioned now. Uh, when the third Tanjavur Air Base was uh, opened to Triple Two Squadron, this is the recent uh, inauguration. You can uh, see the Chief of uh, Defense Staff, the Chief of Air Staff, and uh, the Chief of uh, Naval Staff. The Triple Two Squadron is armed with the Brahmos, and this Brahmos is the anti-ship version. Uh, I will just talk about it uh, uh, in the next slide. Uh, it's called the Tiger Shark Squadron, and it's going to be one of the fulcrum uh, uh, squadrons uh, in the in the south for uh, in the, in the near future. Now, in, it is not only the weapons that we talk about, the fighters that we have, which can uh, uh, be the lethal uh, uh, teeth, which can uh, d- uh, deter the Chinese fleets. We need to have uh, sufficient uh, transport aircraft which can uh, take uh, the Indian Army, uh, Indian Army to uh, uh, wherever uh, the area uh, which is uh, threatened for rapid mobilization. The C-17 Globemaster, which is on the top left, is the world's largest military aircraft in the world. And today we hold the distinction of uh, having the second largest uh, C-17 fleet in the world. The first one of the, uh, is the US Air Force and uh, we are the second we have a very large fleet and there is no place on this planet where the globe master cannot reach the other cargo aircraft we have we have is the il-76 an old uh, 35 40 year old uh, russian aircraft which has actually been the workhorse uh, in the transport fleet uh, it operates out of car and, uh, and of course it is based in chandigarh basically for uh, delay uh, support but uh, the IL-76 can operate out of uh, Kar Nicobar. 
The recent induction includes a C3, C130J Hercules, which needs very short strips. That means many strips in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands will be access to the C130, just not uh, Car Nicobar or uh, Port Blair. It can carry 20 tons of warload. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically a, a commando aircraft uh, for uh, rapid uh, deployment of the Army commandos for extraction of uh, any um, of our uh, citizens who are kidnapped. <clears throat> the other aircraft, which has uh, been uh, a workhorse, it's a, a medium uh, transport aircraft, can just carry about five tons, is the AN-32. You all be familiar. And uh, daily, there is an AN-32, which flies out of Madras to Khan Nicobar and uh, back almost every day. So this is uh, actually a uh, supply line uh, to support the Andamans. We also have an excellent uh, helicopter fleet, the Chinook, which is again the largest military uh, helicopter uh, in the world today. Uh, we have quite a number of uh, these Chinooks. Uh, Inter-island movement, uh, between uh, um, uh, commando movements and uh, support to the land and uh, uh, naval forces, the Chinook is an exceptional uh, aircraft. And we have uh, more than 100 uh, Mi-17 V-5, which is one of the most uh, modern uh, uh, helicopters in the Mi-17 uh, family, where, which has been inducted in the last uh, 10 years. Capable of ni night penetrations in bad weather, so uh, capable of all weather operations. So we have adequate uh, fighter strength, we have adequate uh, transports and helicopter fleet to support and to uh, jointly deter the Chinese uh, Navy into the into our Iowa. Um, most of our flying in, in terms of uh, uh, the maritime in interdiction uh, is uh, through the Navy uh, Donier 228 and the uh, Boeing P-8I Neptune. <clears throat> the anti-ship weapons I needed to cover, the anti-ship weapons which we have is uh, the Jaguar has the AGM uh, 84L, it's harpoon. Its range is more than 100 kilometers, so it can uh, the Jaguar can fly 300 nautical miles out of Port Blair, I mean out of Karnikobar, and able to launch at 100 kilometers distance on any ship. And the Harpoon is a U.S. Uh, anti-ship missile um, made by Honeywell. The Su-30, when we inducted it, we inducted it along with the X-31A anti-ship missile. Again, it's got a range more than 100 kilometers. Uh, all our Sukhois are capable of uh, carrying the anti-ship uh, missile, uh, the X-31A. Um, the recent induction has been the BrahMos. It's been in the news uh, uh, all over. It's, uh, you can see the various uh, type of attack pa patterns it can uh, follow. Uh, for instance, uh, trying to hit a aircraft carrier, which is the juiciest target for any fighter pilot, and it's, he perhaps dreams to uh, hit an aircraft carrier. And uh, you can hit uh, where it's vulnerable instead of hitting it uh, uh, below the bowline. You can hit it from the top and you can tune the Brahmos to hit it in any manner. Likewise, all the anti-ship missiles can be done in a similar manner. The Brahmos triad, all of you know about it. Uh, we have the air triad, we have the army operated from, the, from uh, land. Then we have ship launch as well as the submarine launched. The Su-30, here is the Su-30 carrying out the BrahMos trial, the anti-ship one. Uh, it's a very huge missile. It's 2.5 tons. It's almost uh, 7 meters long. It's a very heavy missile and uh, has ranges up to 300 kilometers. Uh, the circular error probability, that means what is the error it could have, the, the CEP is just 1 meter. So it can hit exactly where you're chosen. Maximum, it will miss the target by a meter. Here you can see the BrahMos uh, uh, test missile being launched uh, by the Sukhoi. The Rafale comes with the AM-39 Exocet anti-ship missile. This is a much later generation. You can see it ca being carried in the belly. It's a very large missile. And uh, the AM-39 Exocet uh, family is very proud to have uh, in the past. It's got a rich history. It sank, uh, it sank the HMS Sheffield in uh, the... Uh, in the uh, uh, Falkland Islands uh, conflict. Uh, it hit the uh, Glamorgan. Uh, it almost sank the uh, Atlantic conveyor and also hit the USS Tuck. 
which uh, was heavily damaged and was listing. The Rafale is armed to the teeth and uh, the kind of weapon systems that it has, it's not only the anti-ship missile that you have to look at. We can we, we have uh, enough destructive power, both on the Sukhois, the, uh, the, the Rafale, which can really threaten the Chinese Navy. Finally, coming to one limitation, which I wanted to mention here, uh, all the limitations uh, revolve around the endurance and the reach of our uh, fighter aircraft. Uh, the Sukhoi 30, for instance, can fly for 10 hours. If you give it fuel, it can fly nonstop from Delhi to London. It can reach London in 10 hours time. But however, it needs uh, an aerial tanker to fuel it in the air. Uh, so basically, if you need it to fly uh, to the coast of Somalia, hit and come back, it will need uh, a tanking somewhere uh, over the Arabian Sea on the outbound and inbound. So we are heavily dependent, if we want to hit the max ranges, we are heavily dependent on the tanker. Here is the IL-78 tanker, which uh, we have six only of them, and we don't have any more tankers. And uh, if we have a conflict which is threaten, threatening us both in the north and in the IOR, then we are going to be uh, critically short of the aerial tanker. So the last 15 to 20 years, in fact, I was involved in it. We, tried, uh, we have tried desperately to get tankers. For some reason or other, it has been uh, stalled. And uh, I recently read in the paper that we are likely to hire tankers till we uh, uh, buy them in the future. As you all know, many air forces, like for instance, the Royal Air Force, hires tankers. It doesn't, it, doesn't own, it, it doesn't operate the tankers, even in war. It hires them and uh, uh, it doesn't have the headache of maintaining and uh, operating them. So this is one uh, option which the Indian Air Force is likely to choose. The defense procurement procedure, I understand, permits hiring. So this is likely to happen and this limitation may not exist. I finish with my presentation. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, Vashmadan. I think it uh, gives us a lot of confidence in the prowess of the Indian Air Force to be able to hold our own. Uh, but of course, I, I also sensed uh, that you were warning us since, uh, that we shouldn't get into complacency. And I think we are continuing to develop our prowess in this region. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive presentation in a short time. Thank you. Uh, may I now reach uh, out to my uh, third distinguished uh, panelist, uh, Lieutenant General P.R. Shankar, a PBSM, AVSM, BSM, the former Director General Artillery and now a Professor of the Aerospace Department, IIT Madras. Uh, he was a retired Director General of Artillery. He's an alumnus of the National Defense Academy, Kharakwasla, Defense Services Staff College, Wellington, Army College, Mao, Na Naval Postgraduate School, Monterey, and National Defense College, New Delhi. He has held many important command, staff, and instructional appointments in the Army. He has vast operational experience, having served in all kinds of terrain and operational situations, which has confronted the Indian Army in the past four decades. He gave great impetus to the modernization of artillery through indigenization. 155 mm gun projects like the Dhanush, the M77 ULH, the Sharang and K9 Vajra as also rocket and missile projects related to Pinaka, Brahmos and Grad BM21 for some of his success. He has, keep not, he has deep knowledge, understanding and experience to successful defense planning and acquisition spanning over a decade. The general officer is now a professor at the Aerospace Department of Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, Chennai, and he's actually actively uh, involved in applied research. And of course, prolific in writing about uh, strategic issues, which we love reading uh, practically every day. Thank you very much uh, and uh, for being here. And uh, over to you. The floor is with yours, General. Uh, thanks a lot once again, Mr. Verma, uh, for that nice introduction. And it gives me great pleasure to be, uh, share stage with uh, Admiral Chatterjee, with whom I'm connecting up after a long time. I last met him in his command in Andaman Nicobar when I went for the BrahMos trials. And it also gives me great pleasure to follow up with uh, Admiral, uh, sorry, Air Marshal Vartaman's excellent presentation on Indian capabilities of how to dominate um, the Indian Ocean. Uh, we've heard a lot about what China does and what you know, everything and how it's going to be the next superpower and things like that. Today, that was a general theme. Uh, at the outset, I have a contra view about China. Despite all that it said and done, 
Uh, there are a lot of gaps in China. And that's what we need to focus on. Notwithstanding that, I'll go through a short presentation on China's maritime presence in the Indian Ocean and Indian, India's options. We all know that China desires to be a superpower and it has to need, it needs a two ocean access. It needs access to the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. If you go into the history of superpowers, that's what it has been. You look at America, it has Pacific and the Atlantic. The Britishers had the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Right? So that's how it is. It needs it. But then, if it has to be a superpower, there are certain issues which China has to do. It has to have full control over the South China Sea, which it is, still doesn't have. Though it's made the first thing with the nine dash line and the, um, uh, militarizing the islands there. PRI and CPEC have to be successful. Pakistan, CPEC, reaching out to the warm waters of the Gulf. It's a must. India has to be contained by the string of pearls. We've spoken in our pulpit. USA has to be sidelined. USA has to be driven away from this area. It has to have considerable presence in the Indo IOR. Someone did speak of the Malacca dilemma, Mr. Varma. It has to get across the Malacca Strait. How, how, what, where else? It, it is already developing a major base at Gwadar. Plus, it needs one in Maldives, Hamban Tuta, or Kaikapu. Uh, of course, it's got its military base at Djibouti. It, these are the preconditions for which China can come and dominate the IOR and be a superpower. Anything less than that is of no value for the kind of investment it is putting in. Now, let's look at what China can do or happening. In the post-COVID phase, its economy is recovering. At this point, I might like to tell you, all what we heard about China in the past 10, 15 years, its development, everything, COVID has changed the you know stage a bit. It's actually flattened the world as never before. And it is from here we have to rebuild things. And you have to look at a new dimension from here on. It's given us a chance. Its economy is recovering. There's no doubt about it. Its navy is expanding. A lot of people have spoken about it. It's it's said to have the largest navy in a few years, overtaking the number of vessels which USA has. It has started solidifying Tibet and Xinjiang. Well, this is critical. One must understand why Xi Jinping went all the way where he went and spoke of solidification of Tibet and Xinjiang. That's their weak area. That's their backyard. And that's the backyard which is restive non-Han, a huge backyard, which USA started targeting. Because so, uh, so, so are we. Because it's put Hong Kong in its pocket, so one less problem. But then Hong Kong has not died out. The recent RCP gives it strength. That's one side of the story. Let's look at it the other side. PLA is tied down in eastern Ladakh along the LAC today, which it never expected. Six to eight divisions are tied down along the LAC. I would say more. And this situation, as it goes, is unlikely to ease. Remember, the Guangdong incident took eight years to you know, normalize. And even after that, the Chinese are still there. So if the situation doesn't ease, China can't pull out troops from there. If it can't pull out troops from there, it can't you know, keep expanding into the seas. There's an entropy about the Chinese armed forces. If you actually analyze the entire PLA, PLAF, PLAGF, PLARF, and PLA Navy, you'll see it is the same amount of people who are being shifted from one end to the other. Right. So, though it has reduced PLA, now with its renewed commitment, it has to rethink. Someone said it wants to tie us down by, you know, a continental outlook. It has to go continental from here on. It just can't. Till now, it had a secure rear base. It doesn't have any more. 
Now, solidification of Tibet imposes resource constraint. There was a, a Belfer Center study out of Howard, I think, which said that the net forces of PLA in Tibet and the LAC were less than what India had along its or uh, India China border. But now, with the situation what it is, it needs more. Okay. Let's look at this what happened in the along the. If you see in the past seven, eight months, the PLA Navy has not left the coastline. It has been contained there. And the USA is not going to vanish. So if someone says he's, he's going to come out all the way here and operate his one and a half carriers in the next 15 years, I think Air uh, Marshal Marthman will be very happy because the Tanjavur base will get operationalized and get some kills also. It's called Tiger Sharks after all. So it's not going to vanish. Okay. Now, you all, we also need to understand overall the CPC and BRI are struggling. For it to pick up, get back the political clout to dominate world institutions, it's going to be a big ask. Right? Every day you see reports coming out of Pakistan for and against the CPEC. I'm talking of ground level situation in Pakistan. And if it doesn't reach the Gwadar and the CPEC doesn't come through, a lot of its gambits will fail. So let's look at it internally. The virus persists, its effect are going to last. It's not going to run away. Its economy has been affected by the worst floods in the past 40, 50 years. The Yangtze Basin and the inland water transport has been badly affected. And it's going to have downstream effects, which we don't know because nothing comes out of China. And it's going through isolation. And I think a lot of people are pretty clear as to what how to deal with China hereafter. So it's not going to have a free run. If it's going to have an RCP with four, four and a half Asian countries and ASEAN, and if it becomes a world power, it cannot happen. There's a world opinion which is going against China, politically. Notwithstanding what there's a change of guard in the USA between Biden and Trump. It's a life struggle for USA itself. Lack of experience. I think this is coming out very, very, very clearly that the Chinese have that much and can do no more. Last year, or take your mind back to Doklam, when the Indian army stood up to Doklam, uh, to the PLA in Doklam, everyone said, what's going to happen? Initially, when Galwan happened, we said, look, we're going to get hit. There are a lot of stories about how, you know, uh, the Chinese are going to come and steamroll us. Where are they now? Stuck. In fact, the international opinion is slowly turning around to the fact that China has not so great. Its limitations have been exposed. Taiwan has out of reach. One month back, every second day, every newspaper coming out of China and every newspaper in that ASEAN region said how China is going to attack Taiwan when the presidential elections are on. Gone. You don't hear of it. Taiwan is still there. Now the cord is coming up with a free and uh, open Indian uh, Ocean strategy. Now France and Germany have come out with their own strategies. It's very clear. They're not. I mean, China is not going to get. I mean, uh, given a free run into these areas. So it's just not India's game. There's something beyond India, right? I don't think it can exert influence in the IOR in the foreseeable future. It will have to redraw its plans. You can't have a country which is fighting at the rear gate in Ladakh and then it wants to fight in the front gate and with its center unstable. With Mongolia also having problems. Right. What is India's interest in this area? There's no doubt. This has already been, you know, long back, Mr. Manmohan Singh, when he was a prime minister, very clearly said India should be the dominant maritime power in its security environment from the Persian Gulf to the Malacca Straits. And if you have to be a regional power, you should have the courage to go across. 
which we already started doing, right? So what are India's options? Very clear. We need to tie down and hold China on the land border through IAF and Indian Army, which are today in the given environment decidedly more superior to the, the PLA. There's no doubt about it. We need to make China and Pakistan look inwards. Tibet, Xinjiang, Balochistan, Gilgit, the whole works. This collusivity you break, make both these of them start looking inwards. Threaten CPEC, China will come to it, it will not enter IOR. I have no doubt about it. We need to build our neighborhood. This came out. In fact, Mr. Verma very beautifully put out Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Nepal, Maldives. Just to amplify, how can you have two neighbors in, say, Bangladesh and uh, Sri Lanka having Chinese weapons for their army? And you don't give your own. I think we need to rethink, redraw our own strategy. Of course, we need to build our partnerships, whether it's a one-to-one -one partnership with USA, Australia, Japan, Quad, France, Germany, Indonesian, uh, IRA, ASEAN. You have to counter China strategically. You need to strengthen island territories. I think uh, Admiral Chatterjee spoke a lot about it uh, earlier when he spoke in the afternoon and now also. And we discussed it. How about Lakshadweep? You you know, the islands in the IO are like pivots of maneuver in deserts. You hold them and you know you can't be shaken out. Of course, you need to build up your navy. Whether you want to go carrier base or a sub base, I think we need to have uh, open debate about it. And personally, I feel within the Navy itself, there are divided opinions. At the uh, national level, we have uh, other issues. Our economy has to rebuild. So all these issues, if you put together, I don't think we will uh, have to take a back foot. In fact, we need to be on the front foot. Right? And with all my interaction which I've had with US people and uh, Australians and everyone, uh, they feel that India has, has a very critical role to play in containing China and keeping China out of the uh, Indian Ocean region. Uh, with this, I have finished. If I have if any questions, I'll, uh, I'll take them on. Uh, thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Jan Shankar. I think it was, again, a very comprehensive, very insightful and thoughtful uh, uh, presentation. I think it does bring out every issue that uh, we had uh, in this topic. Uh, so let me uh, let me just not try and summarize uh, what has been said by the three uh, distinguished panelists, but let's take go to the Q&A and see uh, if there are any questions that need to be uh, sent to us. Is Aishwarya there? She was uh, looking at that or is there anything in the chat box? I haven't seen that. Um. Yes, sir. Just uh, so some of the questions. Some of the questions were answered by uh, the panelists themselves. So should I read the the new one that just came in? Yes, please. Yes. And who is it addressed to? Uh, this question is addressed to uh, Lieutenant General uh, P R Shankar, and it's asked by uh, uh, Mr. Danish Sankhyayan. The question reads: Brahmos is increasing its range. Uh, can it be ranged up? 800 kilometers, um, uh, will India put its own missiles in S-400 apart from uh, 40N6E? Uh, What's that? Look, uh, the BrahMos today, the standard BrahMos has a range of about 290 kilometers. It, uh, I think we fired the 400 plus uh, kilometer uh, BrahMos. Uh, as days go by, we will have a longer range BrahMos that's given. Uh, rather than having a longer range BrahMos, I would go in. I would prefer that India develops a hypersonic system, which we already demonstrated. And plus, you, we just saw Air Marshal Vartaman giving out those beautiful uh, photographs of a Sukhoi mounted with a, a BrahMos 
you know once a sukai you can fly from here to london and from there another 400 kilometers you are halfway into atlantic so we have these capabilities i am not you know minor issues i think and we put our act together at which we are you know brahmos when i started my career i would say when i started treeing brahmos when i commissioned the first brahmos into the regiment of artillery it just had one regiment today we have five six regiments of them the navy has got brahmos the air force has got brahmos and then very often we tend to underestimate ourselves right as a nation this is something which i i, I somehow have never understood we are pretty strong i, I have no other thing and admiral chatterjee will agree with me it was in his tenure that i went and fired brahmos there and the next day i reported to him and i'll confirm what uh, air marshal uh, vartman said 1 meter 1 meter i have seen it fire with the accuracy of 1 meter not on one day on two consecutive days right so i think i am sanguine about it anything any other question yes sir yes sir um uh, another question uh, it's addressed to um uh, vice admiral strategy and it's asked uh, by uh, c3s atreya um besides the populated islands in andaman and nicobar is there one where a free port like uh, singapore can be developed uh, well uh, you know this is a question which has been going through my mind uh, all along my tenure in the andamans if and if you were uh, present for my uh, the session in, when i spoke about the andaman islands and the salience of andamans i compared the islands the entire chain of andaman and nicobar to have six major islands and uh, where i said that you know the northernmost was just about 1.5 the size of singapore then the next one which is just uh, south of that was uh, twice the size and then one the ne- the one which is south of that was 1.2 times the size and there's a smallest island of the andaman chain was just about the same size of singapore and the great nicobar was again uh, 1.2 times the size of singapore so you know you have so many singapores available there and i'm sure by the turn of this century at least one or two would become a uh, Uh, you know will become economic hubs today the government spends about uh, roughly 6000 crores in andamans just to you know to keep the islands running annually now andaman has to generate its own own uh, you know own uh, funds for development and the only way the starting point is i in my mind is investing in defense infrastructure because what happens in defense infrastructure these roads start getting built and things uh, which uh, let's say a private entrepreneur is looking at a private investor is looking at are these basic essentials so you know it's a big catalyst for economic growth and development for us so i i think i have given you a pretty long answer to a very short question but uh, certainly it can happen and it will happen you mark my words because if we don't do it you know we will suffer and then we will do it thank you thank you thank you sir uh i don't know whether how we are doing for time i should have to can we take a question or two more or do you want us to conclude yeah i think uh, we could wind up uh, because uh, i think people are leaving uh, so yeah. maybe you could yes yeah. yeah okay then i'm uh, just uh, i think i'll just do the honors of thanking uh, my english panelists for very comprehensive uh, presentations i think we've been able to highlight the chinese presence in the iowr and what their plans and ambitions for the future are i think there was a note of caution which was rightly sounded that they are really not super power in that sense of the word that we need to be worried about or anxious about their presence in the region Uh, i think we are already taking enough counter measures in work by way of uh, defense uh, our own improvement and capacity and capability building as well as uh, also uh, working with uh, other democracies and in the region to be able to make it more multipolar 
so that we are able to actually defend the interests uh, that uh, that we all need to have, which is uh, ensure three layers of communication, the the proper use of global commons, and nobody actually aggrandizes territory in the region or impedes or puts hurdles in the form of trade or energy routes, and the three layers of communications are left absolutely secure. I think that's the major idea. And uh, I think India would look at a multipolar uh, presence in the region. We welcome that as long as it was peaceful means and rational rule based order. With these few comments, let me thank uh, the host once again for inviting all of us and my distinguished panelists uh, for uh, their excellent presentation. I think I did learn a lot from it. Thank you very much. And let me hand it over to Mr. Nair. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Krishan Verma, for uh, sharing that. Uh, uh, that panel discussion uh, and uh, also for uh, you know holding us all till the end with some very interesting insights right from your uh, your talk itself uh, uh, you know your sort of introduction it went on and uh, you know these are some subjects uh, where people who are interested uh, can listen uh, for a long while thank you so much and also our thanks to uh, uh, Vice Admiral Chatterjee, uh, of course, Air Marshal Vartaman and Lieutenant General Shankar for being there and, uh, of course, giving a wonderful insight. A special thanks, of course, uh, to Air Marshal Vartaman because he took up uh, this, this task, if I might call it, at the very last moment. It's so been very gracious of you to do that. I know it's difficult and you yourself mentioned that you spent so many hours putting this together, but it was a wonderful presentation and my special thanks to you. And of course, from Kamodo Vasan and the team. Thank you so much. So thank you all very much, gentlemen. I, I, I think we'll move on uh, to, uh, you know, listen uh, to Mr. Heblika. Uh, is he there, Mr. Pratap Heblika, who, uh, of course, might not need much of an introduction, but for those here who might not know him too well, uh, Mr. Heblika is uh, the former Special Secretary to the Government of India and is currently, of course, the Managing Trustee of the Institute of Contemporary Studies, Bangalore. He's been decorated for meritorious service and distinguished service by the Government of India. And uh, he has been associated, of course, with several universities here in India and abroad, uh, of course, talking about national security and related issues, including the University of Manipal and the National Institute of Advanced Studies etc so and i must also add that uh, if it uh, if it wasn't uh, for mr heblika uh, you know we might not had some of these uh, conferences at all because it all started 10 years ago when mr heblika and mr chengapa visited the office of the deccan herald where i was in a meeting with one of the directors there and uh, it was then i think it was 2010 or 11 that uh, this whole thing came up of the Press Institute of India getting associated with uh, the uh, with the Institute of Contemporary Studies, Bangalore, to host uh, you know seminars like this for journalists, and of course we uh, did do a lot on that front over the years, both here in Madras and in Bangalore. But those were all physical meetings, which at the end of the day, I might add, is uh, is a lot more pleasure because you get to meet people, you get to sh uh, you know shake hands, and you can see the actual smiles instead of looking at people on the screen. But then now, in COVID times, I think we are not doing too badly either. So over to Mr. Heblika for summing up. <coughs> and of course, for the vote of thanks. <coughs> thanks, Shishi. Um, as you bring down the curtain and two days of uh, you know, hectic um, uh, listening to people from different fields, um, I think it has been a, a wonderful two day session. Uh, when we started this discussion on deciphering China, the aim was to create an awareness about what China is, what was the national security interests of the Chinese Communist Party, what were its objectives, and how was it trying to articulate this in its own way. Uh, about 40 years ago, as Krishan and I would know, we had uh, little access to open information on China. And as a result, we had tremendous difficulties in trying to interpret what was happening in that country. And we had to depend upon our own uh, resources to address this situation. But today, 
uh, we are on the other side of the coin. You have so much of information with us that we need to sift through to make it, uh, to make uh, ourselves understand what is the truth, what is fact, what is fiction, and what is it that is being bandied in the open market for us to read and get confused. So the intention was to create awareness about the Chinese Communist Party and how it intends to build itself into a bigger power than what it is today. And where does India stand? What are the threats and challenges that India needs to see from a diplomatic point of view, from a political point of view, from a military point of view? And how does it all you know, end up in one matrix? Are we strong or are we trying to deprecate ourselves because we don't know our strengths? And where do we go from here? I think that was the aim of the uh, entire <coughs> four-part webinar. And I think we have been able to uh, obtain the objectives of this particular webinar. Uh, there are a number of uh, takeaways. The strength of the webinar, this webinar, lay in the fact that we had 32 resource persons or speakers, excluding the two gentlemen who were the top when we started yesterday. And uh, today's uh, validity excluded. We had 32 resource persons. We spoke in eight sessions plus one panel discussion. We had 16 representatives from the Navy who, who, who gave us a vast idea of what the maritime context was. And in this connection, uh, I would just draw attention to what my colleague, Commodore Udara, had always been telling me, that this country is so lacking in understanding what's happening in the maritime domain, that both in the government and in the civil sector, that we need to focus the torch and make it people understand what we are missing out. I think to that point, both Uday and I are perhaps happy that we have created awareness among the community. Uh, of, of, of the 32, we had 16 officers from the Navy, one from the Army, one from the Air Force, and the rest were former civil servants, members of the academic community, people came from the science and technology side, and from the R&D. I think we had a good mix, and we had uh, uh, people who thought about the subject addressed in very, very you know, diverse but very dedicated manner. The other thing which I would like to focus is, uh, if we, in this country, we have been very shy of getting onto a platform to address, uh, as a matter of public policy, what our national defense policy is, what our national security policy is, what are our interests, and what are our objectives. Tomorrow, I think we would like to see some of our political uh, you know, masters stand up on the platform and tell us what is India's, you know, political uh, national security objectives or national security uh, interests. Like China says, it won't discuss the future of Tibet. It won't discuss the future of Taiwan. Now Hong Kong is in its pocket for keeps. It does not discuss trade. It does not want to discuss the devaluation of the one. I think these are Chinese have stated their national interests very, very clearly. I think we should be in a position with a comprehensive economic strength to tell the world that what are our interests and our objectives. We don't have a national security doctrine as yet. And without this, we are not focused on the way we are headed. What we have discussed today uh, shows that yes, we are coming to a convergence of ideas where we should have a comprehensive policy that dictates our strategic outlook. Now, for example, a few days ago, the uh, Delhi-based uh, magazine, the Bharat Shakti, had its fifth annual conference of, for defense uh, attaches of countries accredited to India, where you had the, the chief of defense staff, the Air Force chief, and the Navy chief telling us what they thought about the certain areas of uh, the industry partnership with the defense uh, establishment. We require more such you know, platforms where people understand that, yes, India means uh, it is strong, India means business, and India wants to uh, take things ahead. The, the fourth leg of this particular uh, webinar was to create awareness among people who do not have access to this kind of information, either on a, on a periodical basis or on a regular basis. I think, for example, students, uh, academics, research scholars, think tanks 
need to understand that there is so much information available within us that once we bring it onto the same platform that we are able to develop a comprehensive a co cohesive picture so i think to that point our webinars uh, we had two earlier one was to understand uh, the cyber security strengths of china and how does india stand vis a vis that and also the first one which is a curtain raiser when we talked about the uh, you know uh, comparative national security strategies of both india and china and how we are today in the present uh, context so in that direction i think um, we have had uh, three webinars the fourth one which comes sometime later we'll talk about uh, china's media landscape how the chinese communist party of, uh, of china uses the media to further its own uh, objectives or interest so having said all this i think um, we have achieved what out what we set out to do and i think uh, having listened to some very very senior professionals in the civil and military field one is the assured that you no know, india is in the right direction we may have lost out a total of 15 years in the race but i'm sure eventually we will get there because india's strength lies in its own technology and we have to bring it to bear on some of the policies that we need to follow and uh, i think that would be something that uh, i would be writing about in the next couple of days uh, we wanted to do this on the 26th of november because it was Uh, dedicating the webinar to those martyrs who fell on this uh, uh, who were fighting 12 years ago in mumbai and again this comes ahead of the navy week within a week from now at least of the maritime context in that sense becomes more important to people who will see what's happening in the newspapers when india celebrates the navy week uh, having said this uh, i would like to now take on the second responsibility given by shashi i would like to thank um, five youngsters who have been part of this team uh, two from bangalore and three from chennai uh, uh, two from bangalore are the ones who came in at the last moment when we wanted to have a plan b in case uh, we had to shift it from chennai to bangalore so i would thank anant lakshmi and uh, pravina from christ university for being our backup again bala then uh, ashwarya and uh, mr naya mr naya's colleague who held the fort in chennai i think they have worked uh, pretty hard in the last uh, several weeks to make this thing happen so well and above all i would like to thank each and every speaker named or unnamed today for having spared his valuable time uh, there is a saying uh, when i was posted in seychelles when we set up the uh, seychelles military academy the defense academy we had a captain um, arun madan who was our uh, defense advisor in tanzania and dar es salaam he used to say when you sit in the union and have the good things you did and good things you want to do i think we i take forward arun's advice i think we have uh, done a tremendous job in the last uh, two days and all those who have spared their valuable time have also done it in the case of a national interest so this is the uh, we did this uh, not as a paid um, webinar but one pay it is our cause corporate social responsibility to the people and the younger generation of this country so ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for having joined us in this uh, celebration of uh, the webinar on maritime context we hope by next year we will be able to build on it and bring out uh, more dimensions of the same subject thank you very much god bless and jai hind